Julie Robenheimer covers all of the National Hockey League and USA Hockey for Elite Prospects joins us today. We haven't seen her since the World Juniors. Hey, Julie, I just looked up your, your uh, Twitter bio. Romans 1212. Can you very quickly tell us what that is? Do you remember? <laughs> uh, of course I remember, but it's basically saying in, in all things, be patient and trust in the Lord. So, um, you know, whether you're uh, happy, give thanks. Whether you're in despair, give praise. Um, it's all just knowing that he's right there beside you. Of course. Uh, great work. And uh, yeah, and it says to be joyful in hope as well. So. <laughs> Well, I've, everybody in New Jersey that's a hockey fan and the Devils fan base are with 13 straight wins. Did you? I didn't see a lot of pen, pundits that had New Jersey being this hot out of the gate and up to U.S. Thanksgiving. Did you? So what I saw uh, at the beginning of the year with their roster is that they were uh, incredibly deep in what they could present as an offensive attack. And I feel like that has been one of the biggest strengths of their game is that any line that they throw over the boards is a threat to score. There really is no checking line. They might be a fourth line. They might be considered a grind line. But all of them have the potential to put the puck in the net. And they do so on a consistent basis. You know, we, a lot of attention is obviously put on uh, Jesper Bratt and what he's been able to do uh, so far this season, following up on last year's great season. Um, but there's lots of contribution. Obviously, Jack Hughes, Nico Hishier, um, you know, uh, Igor Sharangovich. Um, there's, there's a lot of offense. The biggest question mark for them was their defense, which they made some moves to shore that up uh, in the offseason, and you're seeing that happen. And then, of course, the biggest question mark was in goal. And still more question marks developed in that area this year, but... They're having the guys um, step in and, um, you know, getting uh, a, a solid backup in uh, uh, Vanacek is, has been, I think, the biggest key to this long run for them and just how solid he's played. So a lot of the offseason moves that um, Tom Fitzgerald did to make the team just a little bit better um, are really paying off. I think the changes and improvements that he made are, are even better than he probably anticipated. Well, the Associated Press story from Monday night's Devils 5-2-1 over the orders referred to New Jersey as the no-name uh, no name Devils, and I feel like that's kind of a disservice to them. It's kind of uh, an insult. Because in Canada, as you know, you spend enough time there, we know who all these players are. Is that... Nobody knows them around New Jersey or what? Like, is that a fair comment to call them the no-name devils, do you think? Well, it's not a fair comment to call them the no-name devils. What really that is, is an indication mm -hmm. that you are not paying attention to them. That doesn't mean everybody else isn't paying attention to them, right? So um, it's hard to call them the no-name devils when they have two first overall picks uh, on their roster uh, yeah. who are regularly contributing and then you have a player like Jesper Bratt who's like top 10 in, in the league in scoring um had a ridiculously good season last year um is gonna is he's printing money at this point like it's he's just like the FBI is gonna come for him pretty soon because he's just manufacturing money with each shift uh, let alone each game so um I think the biggest issue is just in your belief that there's nobody worth paying attention to um, on that team. So again, not an indictment of the devils, but definitely an indictment of, of those saying that. Of the writer. Yeah, exactly. Before we move on to the Philly Flyers, I just want to ask you about the orders. If you have an opinion on that, a viewer uh, wrote in earlier and said, what's their problem right now? Uh, losing five, two in New Jersey. Uh, did you watch all of the game? Do you have a, a uh, I want to take a swing in that one, what the orders are missing right now. Well, I didn't watch that game because I was at the Flyers game uh, against Calgary last night, but um, I, I will take a swing at it. And basically what the Flyers, excuse me, what the Devils have is what the Oilers don't have. And that's depth and scoring. And, you know, losing Evander Kane um, was a big key to that because he did provide um, that, um, you know, depth and offense and being able to have multiple threats instead of just Connor and Leon. and. Um, so, so to me, that's the biggest challenge and, and even more so 
in the league in general, like it is so easy for fans to say, make a trade, like make something happen. Yeah, that's hard to do. Like this isn't fantasy where you can just like go get somebody. Uh, it, it doesn't always work like that. You need a willing partner. So just because something isn't happening doesn't mean, you know, like Ken Holland or another GM isn't trying to actively improve their team. Um, it just means that nothing has uh, come to fruition just yet. So at the same time, you know, I sit there and I say, you don't want your team to hinge on one player, whether that be Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl or Evander Kane, as the case may be in this current situation. So you have to look at the bigger picture and say, you know, where can we improve overall in, in the depth? That is, for a GM is a double-edged sword because then, of course, you have fans saying, well, that guy's not going to do anything for us or be significant for us. So it's one of those things where, as in my opinion, if you're a GM in Canada, like, I really don't care what the fans are saying because they're, they're going to hate you no matter what you do. Uh, it's not going to be good enough unless you win the Stanley Cup. So, um, you know, it's a tough gig to be a GM uh, for a Canadian team. That's for sure. There's no doubt. Uh, by the way, Angelo listening in Marietta, Georgia, says Chico referring to Chico Resch, who you'd know, the color mm-hmm. voice of the devil, says he doesn't like referring to the fourth line. He says all lines are important. Uh, yeah, the, Chico doesn't like the term fourth line. They're just as important as any other. Yeah, well, no coach is like referring to that because they don't want to hurt the fourth liner's feelings. What I would say is if you were better, you'd be on the first line. So suck it up. It's still first, second, third, and fourth lines. Gosh. Anyways, what was your takeaway? We <laughs> well, wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Before we get off that topic, I think that the key here is not to label them uh, one through four, because that seems like a ranking system, but labeling them in terms of their contribution to the team, um, I think, is more what Chico is getting at and saying, like, this is your grind line and that's perfectly acceptable. But to, quote, rank <laughs> them the fourth is not OK. Well, it's ranked on what order they appear on the ice has generally been what it has been as To me, and I'll never forget Ty Domi walking into Pat Quinn's office when he coached the Leafs and said, Coach, uh, why do you have me on the fourth line? And Pat Quinn said to Ty Domi, because we don't have a fifth line. Get out of my office. Anyways, what was your takeaway from the Philly-Calgary game Monday night? Let's end it there. So I think the, well, do you want the Philly perspective or the Calgary perspective? Both. Oh, we only have a minute. So whatever you want, pick one. So we'll go with the, the Philly perspective only because I've been around them a lot longer. Uh, they work really, really hard. They are severely lacking in skill. And they have such a young team that they are making a lot of defensive mistakes. Like the first two goals that Calgary scored last night were uh, defensive gaffes where the defenseman jumped into the play and the forwards did not cover him and led to a two-on-one that ended up in the back of the net. So um, those are the issues that that the Flyers are having. But I will say the good news is that they are scoring. They are generating chances. And it's easier to be optimistic when you are at least generating offensive opportunities and know that you can put in the work to fix the defensive issues within your game. Whereas if they weren't scoring, if they weren't generating anything, um, it would be a a lot more challenging and a bigger hole for them to dig out of. So they're still dealing with a lot of injuries. We'll see if Chuck Fletcher wants to do anything about that in terms of bringing people in, whether he can or not. I mean, there's such a cap crunch in Philadelphia that it may not even be possible, that they are just going to have to ride out these young guys and, and see what can happen. That said, I don't think they're opposed to that. They do have these young guys. They do want them to play. And I will also say, even if like right now they're right around 500. So you know, may not actually happen, but it'd be bad. This is a good year to be bad because this year's draft class is a plus. So you never know. Oh yeah. No kidding. Julie, uh, wonderful job as always. Happy Thanksgiving. And we'll chat with you down the road. You too. Thanks for having me. Hey everybody. Thanks for watching the RP show on YouTube. And don't forget we're live daily on YouTube from noon to two Eastern. If you like what you see, Hit subscribe, and if you like the program, check around for other segments of The Rod Peterson Show here on YouTube.